We now have a table of the functions of judgment, but that's not really what Kant was after, right? Kant wanted to find those concepts, uh, those concepts of the pure understanding that are sort of there a priori, that are presupposed in the ability to cognize objects. Now, whenever we think about like cognizing objects and the conditions for that, the conditions of possibility for that, we are doing something transcendental, right? We are engaged in transcendental philosophy. And so Kant wants something transcendental, uh, something that belongs to transcendental logic, because it's about the understanding. But this table of the logical functions of the understanding and judgments hasn't talked about objects at all, right? This was general logic. This was just judgment in general, whether or not it is to be cognition of objects. And so what we need, Kant thinks, is what we really need is to answer a question that we haven't even really asked yet. And that is what we really need is a table of categories. What are categories? Well, Kant takes this term from Aristotle. Um, for Kant, the categories are what I, what I just told you, right? They are the basic concepts that are necessary for our conceptual thinking to be about objects. Okay, so how do we get to the categories? I mean, how does the table of the functions of judgment even, even help us getting to the categories? Well, Kant has a story about that at the beginning of paragraph 10, and it's a pretty complicated story, and in part is it, it is a complicated story because he is pointing forward to things that he hasn't told us about yet, right? So suddenly, here on A77, B103, um, suddenly we are being told about synthesis. Then the imagination makes a surprise appearance. Synthesis in general is, as we shall subsequently see, the mere effect of the imagination of a blind though indispensable function of the soul without which we would have no cognition at all. Okay, thanks. Uh, where did this come from? What is the imagination? As we shall subsequently see, Kant is going to talk a lot more about the imagination in the future when we get to the transcendental deduction. Um, he's sort of just dropping it here, and it's kind of hard to follow, of course, what's going on. But what's going on is, is, is at least in part the following. Kant wants to tell us a three-part story of how we get to the cognition of an object. So, what we get is, first of all, a manifold in intuition, right? And we know that this pure manifold is space and time, and in, like, actual sensation, that's going to be filled in with sensation. But there's this pure manifold of space and time. Now, according to Kant, that is, that is not enough, right? The pure manifold of space and time is not enough for us to have any cognition. The spontaneity of our thought requires that this manifold first be gone through, taken up and combined in a certain way in order for a cognition to be made out of it. I call this action synthesis. Okay, so that is synthesis. And it is the synthesis of a manifold that first brings forth a cognition. Uh, and so it is the first thing to which we have to attend if we wish to judge about the first origin of our cognitions. Then Kant tells us that this synthesis in general is the effect of the imagination. And he goes on to say that to bring this synthesis to concepts is a function that pertains to the understanding. And so we get a sort of three-part story here. First, there is this intuition, this manifold given in intuition. Then there is the synthesis of the imagination, of which Kant still owes us an explanation. And then... This synthesis will be brought to concepts by the understanding. Okay, it will be brought to concepts by the understanding. Um, and that, of course, is what we are really interested in here at this point in the transcendental logic, this role of the understanding. So, again, a little later on. Transcendental logic, however, teaches us how to bring under concepts not the representations, but the pure synthesis of representations. The first thing that must be given to us a priori for the cognition of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition. The synthesis of this manifold by means of the imagination is the second thing, but it still does not yield cognition. 
the concepts that give this pure synthesis, synthesis unity and that consists solely in the representation of this necessary synthetic unity are the third thing necessary for cognition of an object that comes before us and they depend on the understanding. The same function that gives unity to the different representations in a judgment also gives unity to the mere synthesis of different representations in an intuition, which expressed generally is called the pure concept of the understanding. And so, Kant tells us, the same understanding, and indeed by means of the very same actions, through which it brings the logical form of a judgment into concepts by means of the analytical unity, also brings a transcendental content into its representations by means of the synthetic unity of the manifold in intuition in general, on account of which they are called pure concepts of the understanding that pertain to objects a priori. This can never be accomplished by general logic. What, what is Kant doing here? So, first, we have this three-stage story of bringing something to cognition. Uh, uh, bringing an object to cognition. One, it has to be given an intuition. Two, the intuition has to be synthesized in or by the imagination. We don't really know what that means at this point, at this point in the critique, so we'll have to take Kant at his word. Three, the understanding has to create unity of this synthesis. Okay, what is the understanding? Well, the understanding was the ability to judge, right? And it did that using these 12 functions of judgment or functions of the unity of judgment. That was what the understanding needs to create unity. And so what Kant is going to say here is that, well, you know, there's the understanding like left on its own using these 12 functions. That's what we were talking about in general logic just now. But now this very same understanding has got to create a unity in this synthesized manifold. But it's the same understanding, equipped with the same functions. So what are we going to find? Well, we're going to find that the ways that the understanding does this are just the same. They're the same functions, but applied now to this, synth to this manifold synthesized in the imagination. And these applications, and these are going to be 12 applications because there are 12 functions, these 12 applications to the manifold, to like the objects that are given in intuition, that is the like material use of these functions. That is the use of these, the objective use of these functions. That is what we are after when we are trying to find the categories. Okay, so again, I think there are details of this story that we can't really understand at this moment in the critique. But the basic idea, I hope, should be clear. And that basic idea is that because it is the understanding that has to apply concepts to intuitions, that has to bring intuitions to a sort of unity in concepts, uh, in judgments, it's the same understanding that we were just investigating in its purely logical use, where we found these 12 basic functions. Well, those same 12 basic functions have to be used because that's what the understanding is, right? Um, those same 12 functions have to be used here in its um, objective use, we could say, in its use when we're not in pure logic, but when we are cognizing objects. And so that's how we find the categories. We find the categories by taking the 12 functions of the unity of judgment and considering what they become, what they are, when they are applied to objects. What are they when they are applied to objects? And so Kant gives us the table of categories at A80, B106. And it's beautiful. There's 12 of them. They're quantity, quality, relation, and modality. It is an exact mirror image of the table of the functions of the unity of judgment. That is nice. And then, of course, Kant does this ultra-Kantian thing. And now I, I read from B112. Third remark. So B112, B112. Third remark, the agreement of a single category, namely that of community, which is to be found under the third title with the form of a disjunctive judgment, 
which is what corresponds to it in the table of logical functions, is not as obvious as in the other cases. And then Kant is going to tell us a little bit about why community in the table of categories fits with the disjunctive in the table um, of logical functions. Not as obvious as, I mean, still obvious, right? But not as obvious as the other 11. And so I think it's sort of a Kantian move because the effect it generally will have on the reader, I think, is I must be really stupid because I don't think it's obvious. I mean, maybe some of them are obvious, but others aren't very obvious. So some of them seem to be obvious, right? I mean, take something like like the, the categories of, the, of modality, right? That the problematic, assertoric, and apodictic, right? The might, the is, and the must be. That if I think of those things in terms of being applied to objects, that then I get the possible object, the existing object, and the necessary object. That makes a lot of sense, right? An assertion, a claim might be problematic, assertoric, or apodictic. An object in sort of the same way could be a possible existing or necessary object. We can sort of see that. It's, it's kind of obvious. Well, what about quantity? Universal, particular, and singular becomes unity, plurality, and totality. And that doesn't seem obvious at all. I mean, maybe, maybe the particular, which is some, right, in which we make a distinction between the trees that are green and the trees that are not green, like some trees are green, okay, that sort of posits two different groups, right? The trees that are green and the trees that are not green. That's certainly something that's, that's in that function, we could say. And so plurality, like having more than one, okay, we can see how that fits. But what about the universal and unity and the singular and totality or allness? Allness, that's what Kant also calls this, totality or allness. Well, the universal was all, but it fits here with unity and not with totality or allness. So how does that work? Is that obvious? In fact, it is so not obvious that many commentators have claimed that Kant just got confused, that he just switched the order in the list of quantities, and that what he actually meant was that the universal fits totality and the singular fits unity. Okay. Um, maybe, though on the other hand, mm, that, that does seem a bit unlikely. I mean, it's it's kind of obvious. I mean, these tables are, are hard to miss, right, when you are looking over your own book. Um, and he made a second edition and never changed it. If it just were a stupid blunder, that would be weird. So is there a way for us to understand unity, like, like the one, plurality, the many, and totality, like everything, the whole lot? Can we relate them in some way to the universal, particular, and singular form of judgment? Well, here's one way to think about it. If I say all trees are green, that all, with that all, I'm taking them all as a unit, right? I'm not making any distinctions. So there's a sense in which, which that generates unity. And um, then in, if I say some trees are green, I am positing at least sort of a two-ness, Right? Some are green, some are maybe not green. I'm sort of positing the possibility of this two-ness. Um, so we can see how plurality might correspond to that. Now, if I say something like this tree is green, well, that this sort of limits off the universe of my discourse. Right? What am I talking about? What am I, I making? I'm, I'm making claims about this. Right? This is all, everything, the totality of things that my judgment is about. This, this group, this thing. Um, so, yeah, I guess it does make some sense, actually. Um, I don't think it's totally weird to, to think of the singular and totality uh, belonging to each other. And I think it makes even more sense if we read what Kant says a little bit further on, um, when he talks about number. Thus, the concept of a number which belongs, so this is B111, thus the concept of a number, 
which belongs to the category of allness or totality, is not always possible wherever the concepts of multitude and of unity are, e.g. in the representation of the infinite. What does he mean? The infinite. Let's take infinite space. Infinite space requires us to think in terms of plurality, like there are many, many parts of space. In fact, infinitely many parts of space. So there are many parts of space, uh, but it's all space, right? It's all one. So it's also a unity. It's a unity of a plurality. But is it a totality? Well, Kant says, no. Um, I mean, you can't apply a number to it. You can never say, oh, this. This, this is it. This is the universe of my discourse. And it, is, it has seven elements or 13, right? You, can't, you can never point at the total. Um, so all, like the, the, the universal judgment is sort of unlimited. But a totality is something limited, right? That, that seems to be maybe um, uh, the way that Kant is thinking about that. So I think we can, we can sort of see how this corresponds to each other. Okay, affirmative, negative, infinite, uh, belonging to reality, negation, and limitation. We can probably kind of see, see that too. Um, now, by the way, for all of these terms, they're going to feature more uh, when we come to the analytic of principles later on. So we will have an, another opportunity to see all of them in action, as it were, to think a little bit more about things like unity, plurality, totality, reality, negation, and limitation. Um, then we will also see that the ones that Kant is by far the most interested in, uh, in his metaphysical project, are going to be the categories of relation, of inherence and subsistence, of causality and dependence, and of community. So let's look at them in a little more detail. So in our table of functions, logical functions, we have the categorical, which I've also called predication, right? It's all trees are green. That, that kind of predicating of green, of the concept of green, of the trees, that is what the categorical judgment is, is doing. Um, and Kant says, well, this is a relation of inherence and subsistence, right? There is um, a substance to which we apply a property. There is the trees and we apply the property green to them. Um, that is precisely sort of in metaphysical terms what we mean by, well, substance and accident. He calls it here also in Latin, substantia et accidens. Um, when we think of predicating something, like not in a logical sense, but in a real sense, what we mean, what we are thinking about are things, substances having properties, right? That's sort of the real use the objective use of that form of thought. When we think of something uh, of this hypothetical, this if-then, this ground consequence relation, when we think of that objectively as applied to objects, what are we thinking of? Well, we're thinking of one object or event leading to something else, right? We are thinking of the relation of cause and effect. So causality and dependence is what Kant tells us here. And then finally, and Kant says, well, this is the one that is maybe least obvious, this disjunctive idea where we cut up reality into several things and say, well, you know, it's one of these. According to Kant, that fits with the relation of community, a reciprocity between agent and patient. Um, so he's thinking about sort of interaction between different things or different substances. And we may wonder how that fits this idea of, of, of disjunction. Um, isn't that just a kind of causal relation maybe? But really what Kant is pointing out is, well, first of all, he will point out in a little bit that um, we can have the idea of substance and we can have the idea of, of, of like substances having sort of this internal causality without having the idea of, of interaction at all. That seems to be a new idea that is added to that. But what's more, it is only this idea of interaction, really, that generates in us the idea of a world, right? It's only because all the substances in the universe are in interaction with each other, that nothing is isolated, that they belong to the same world. 
And so this logical idea of a space of, of possibilities that we can cut up into different parts and this real idea of the world that is cut up in different parts, namely all these different objects or substances, that does seem to have some kind of, you know, they do seem to be sort of formal complements to each other. Um, and so it's not, I would say, a very weird idea that Kant is, uh, is pushing here. Okay, so what I've wanted to do with this table of categories is I have not, I think, given any sort of clear and full argument that Kant is right. Uh, I mean, even internally, that given the table of functions of unity of judgment, this is the table of categories, right? That if you take them and you apply them to objects, you get this. Uh, in some cases, it's kind of obvious. In other cases, it's maybe slightly less obvious, but but obviousness is hardly a very like good criterion. We haven't really been given a, a method for getting from one to the other or an argument or something that we can truly assess in that sense. Um, what I have tried to, to suggest is that, is that it makes sense that on Kant's own terms, you know, this table of categories makes a lot of sense, that some of the things that seem weird about it maybe aren't that weird at all. Um, and so possibly one could work things out and one could say, oh yeah, by the way, Kant is right, these are the categories. And that's not the aim of this video, um, but I do hope to have given you sort of a framework in which it makes sense and in which you can at least imagine that there is argument possible about whether Kant got up with the right categories or whether he made mistakes or confused certain things or should have framed things differently. All of which is on the table, of course. I mean, maybe he, he did make mistakes, or maybe it isn't, like, perfect. Um, but at least it's not random, right? And sometimes Kant has been accused of having sort of um, a vague idea of this, these categories already, and then, you know, coming up with this logical story behind them and sort of pushing them in the table to make it fit, even though it doesn't really fit. And I think that is too negative. I mean, that doesn't seem to be what's going on. Uh, Kant, Kant, I think, takes the metaphysical deduction very seriously. And from what we have seen so far in these videos, it is not clear that the metaphysical deduction is hopeless. Right? Maybe it's also not clear that it's all perfect, but it's also not clear that it's hopeless. And that, of course, is one of the reasons that there is a fast-growing literature about what's going on in the metaphysical deduction um, and in how far Kant is right. So there's a lot more to explore there if you want to, uh, but I think we have seen enough of the metaphysical deduction for now, and we should go on. I'm going to skip over paragraph 12 entirely, actually. actually. Um, we are going to go on to the Transcendental Analytics second chapter, um, the Transcendental Deduction, which is generally acknowledged to be the hardest part of the book. Thank you.